Hey everyone, welcome to Sunshine Hills Church Online. So glad you're joining with us today. We are excited to have Pastor Tom back with us today, sharing the word, what God has laid on his heart, and we can't wait to hear uh, the message that he has for us. So uh, make sure you're ready, got your notes ready to go, your Bible, it's going to be a good time together. A couple quick announcements. Uh, men, men's retreat is like next weekend, so if you're still on the fence, get decided and get signed up this week. It's going to be a great time away next weekend together, and women, your retreat coming up at the end of May. We want to encourage you to sign up for that as soon as possible as well. We are so looking forward to being back in person for retreats again this year. They are such a powerful time together. I also want to let you know that VBS registration, summer VBS registration for our kids is open now. And next weekend, kids camp registration opens for our kids as well. Uh, So if you're looking to have your kids enrolled in VBS and enrolled in kids camp, uh, they are wonderful times during the summer for the kids to just be together uh, with peers from their own age and learning about God and having fun and playing games, uh, we want to let you know that that, those registrations are open. And for more details, please message Victoria in the church office. She'll get you all the information you need to get signed up and have your kids be involved in those great things coming up this summer. Uh, Last note, uh, at the end of today's message, stay tuned as Danny Hunt will be here uh, for this month's missions presentation. And that will be our service today. Are you ready? Are you excited? Church starts now. Well, what a privilege it is for me to once more stand in front of this camera and be able to share with you what's on my heart. As the um, lead pastor that is now retired, it gives me the freedom to be able to, I feel, um, address some things that are heavy on my heart. And I appreciate the fact that um, Pastor Danny allows me to do this. What I have to share today is, is, is I hope, an encouragement for change. And it does not come across as in any way, shape, or form as condemning. I want to talk to us today about the whole idea of unity and biblical unity. I'm going to ask this question. What does unity look like? Do we really even know? I want you to know the Holy Spirit whispers to me that we as a church and we as people who uh, have Jesus as our Savior and are making him our Lord, we really need to be paying attention in this season. And if you forget everything else that I have said, pay attention. And I feel God is calling us. He is reminding us to pay attention to the main thing. Let's pray. Oh, Father, as we gather here this morning... Lord, whether people are watching at whatever hour of the day or night, I pray, Father, that I will be able to communicate, Lord Jesus, what is on my heart, what you have been whispering to me. I ask this, Father, in Jesus' name. Well, there have been many casualties over the last few years um, through this uh, pre-COVID, post-COVID situation And I am going to make some pretty strong statements. I believe that there has been an assassination of the truth. What is truth? Pontius Pilate asked that at Jesus' trial. When Jesus was going back and forth, he asks the rhetorical question, what is truth? It's a question that has been wrestled with for many times. I took philosophy in my undergraduate degree. And uh, part of the whole idea about philosophy is, is the whole idea about epistemology. That's a big word, which means how do we know what's true? Well, there's been a real shift about what truth is. There has also been an assault on unity. In my years on this earth and in my role as pastor and living life, I have never seen the level of viciousness, acrimony, and disunity that we are now experiencing. The polarization in our world is crushing. The middle ground, if it ever existed, is fast disappearing. That positions are hardening, and there is just this, I'm right and you're wrong, and it, it, this particular malady, I believe, has infiltrated into the churches. I believe that it is coloring our thoughts. And we, I feel God is calling us to a different response than perhaps we are currently making. 
Disunity is not something that's new. It plagued the New Testament church. Churches, I should say, because there were many of them. And Paul, he referred to the, the believers there in Corinth as saints. It's set apart. But if you read through that, it did not keep them from falling into the trap of disunity and factions. Now, as I go through this, I am encouraging you to engage in this discussion. Where are you? Where am I? This is not me up on my, my, my perch preaching down at you. It is something that I find myself grappling with. Let's interact. The question is, are we falling in to the trap of disunity and factions? Now, people are people. Um, Linus Van Pelt from the Peanuts uh, characters and once upon a time we used to have newspapers remember those and there would be the comic section and, and uh, Charles Schultz he wrote this strip called Peanuts and uh, Linus Van Pelt is perhaps my favorite character in the bunch and um, he there's this one statement that he makes uh, he says I love mankind it's people I can't stand I've talked with my pastoral friends and, you know, every uh, calling has, as it were, it's, quote, black humor. And we just said, you know, this pastor gig wouldn't be so bad if it weren't for the people. <laughs> but the reality is that we are called to shepherd, steward, care for, keep people safe. I don't believe that that's only the calling of pastors, but I think in a very real way that people who are followers of Jesus are called to protect and to keep people moving together in unity. I believe one of the Satan's plays out of his playbook is to diminish the effectiveness of the church, and one of his strongest plays is to destroy unity. I've thought about this, and I, I like to read, and somebody said that Satan has perhaps a limited genius. He only has a few plays in his playbook. But I would suggest to you he doesn't have to have a complicated or big playbook. The plays that he's running work very well and have worked well since the, the fall of mankind. I believe that God is calling us to a different response. And so if you have your Bibles handy, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Now, I have older eyes, and so I have my Bible handy here because I want to make sure I'm sending the message that all of what I'm trying to say, I believe, is rooted and grounded in the Word, but I have it blown up for my old eyes. And here's what Ephesians says. Paul was writing to uh, his charges there in the, in the city of Ephesus. It says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge, that's a very strong word, I urge, I exhort, you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. I want to underscore that. Be completely humble. Humility is this quality of saying, I don't know everything. And I have a perspective, but just because I have that perspective does not mean that somehow I have a corner on the truth. I would say beware anyone, including any pastor or any evangelist or any person in a podcast or over the airways, that saying that they have some handle or some corner on the truth. Be very careful. It says, and be gentle, be patient. These are all uh, part of the fruit of the Spirit. Bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep. And that word keep is a very rich word in the Greek. It means to guard. It means to protect. It means to preserve the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. And again, if you read through this, that God has called us to peace. He has not called us to be constantly fighting and grappling and quarreling and quibbling about different things. I believe that, yes, there's a place for good discourse, and my brother and I and my family of origin, we like to have debates. Hopefully they didn't get vicious and un unloving. But at the end of the day, are we in our zeal to try to grapple with all of these things? Are we missing the one main thing? And we're going to find out what is that one main thing. Here's what Paul continues to say. He's, there is one body. I want you to underscore all of the ones. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called one Lord, one faith one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all in all. 
I, I don't even have to comment on that. I would hope that you would read that again and again and again and realize that this is a way of taking the fruit of the Spirit and applying it to the lives that we walk in a manner and a way that is worthy of our calling. We are not called to be people who are stirring the pot and, and, and picking up causes. We are people who are called to the one thing. We're going to come back to that. Then I want to look at Psalm 133 and my my personal Bible reading, I read you know, parts of the Old Testament and then the Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastic, Song of Songs, and then I jump to the New. Well, right now I'm in Psalms. In Psalm 133, it's a song of ascent. And a song of ascent was, this was something that the people were rehearsing and saying out loud as they would go from here up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was, was, in, was in higher ground. And once they got into Jerusalem, the temple was on the mountain. And so when, as they were going up and they were going up the steps, they were preparing their hearts. And so this is what the psalmist says. He says, how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters live together in unity. It is like precious oil on the head, running down the beard, running down Aaron's beard, down the cloak and the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessings, even life forevermore. Again, I, I, I want to ask a question. Are you, am I, is the church that we call home, is the church of Jesus Christ, are we truly following this? This is a song of a sense as we're coming up. Notice what's happening here is that it's pleasant, it's good, and it's like the, the oil, and oil in the, in the New Testament and the Old Testament is a metaphor for the Holy Spirit. And it's not just a little dabble, do you? But it's this oil that just it just permeates and it just flows all the way down, even down to where we're walking. And it says it's it result and the result is that God commands his blessing. Here's my question. We pray, oh Lord, bless my family. Are you living in unity? Oh Lord, bless my marriage. Are you living in unity? Oh Lord, bless our church. Are we living in unity? Oh Lord, may your church make a difference in our world. Are we living in unity? And I I can only say my perception, my reality is that we are not. All too often, we are not walking in the truth of Psalm 133. I charge you, I encourage you to read that passage of Scripture often and say, am I really embracing this? For there, where there is unity, the result is that God commands his blessing. There's a warning in James chapter 3, 14 to 16. He says, but if you harbor, that is, you take it, you, you let it... Uh, Put its anchor and it, you, you are dwelling there. It's residing in your place. If you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. There's that truth word again. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and of the devil. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, you will find disorder. And that word there says confusion, instability, and every evil practice. Now, I don't want to get too far into this, but uh, I'm going to just throw this out. I feel that this this mantra that's being touted even within this thing called the church about my rights and my freedoms, I do not believe that that is a biblical idea. Jesus has called us to freedom, and I am a freedom fighter, but I am a freedom fighter for people to come and be set free to, from all of the things that bind them. That's the freedom that Jesus came. And we have to be very careful when we have personal and selfish agendas. And that can look as simple and as dangerous as, well, I'm right. We don't necessarily say it, but we say, well, I've got the corner on this. We need to be very careful. And it says this, there is disorder in every evil work. As the lead pastor here for almost 40 years, I paid very close attention to this for my own life, and for our church. And when, when I began to sense disunity and confusion and instability, I would come back to this passage of Scripture, and I would say, Lord, are we, are we pushing our own selfish agenda? Something to think about. 
The signs of the last times, Matthew 24. Pastor Danny talked about this. I think he, may, he read it out of Mark, but it's the same. It's known as the, uh, uh, the, the synoptic or seen together apocalypse. It says, at that time, many will turn from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Now, betrayal is not a, a value of the kingdom, and certainly hatred is not. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. So I'm suggesting to you, we've really got to keep our eyes on Jesus. As I am the way, Jesus said, the truth and the life. No one comes in the Father but by me. And so it said, there will be many who will come to deceive, and many will be deceived. And so if you say, oh, I can't be deceived, I'm always nervous. I've talked with my friends when somebody says, well, that would never happen to me. I said, please don't say that. That a lot of these things could happen to any of us. We must keep up our spiritual guard and our eyes fixed on Jesus. And it says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and the end will come. So when we think about what's the one thing, the one thing is we are here to proclaim the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now it says, and because of increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. And I was talking with my good friend Dave Each, and, and uh, he went and heard one, another one of my friends, Ted Vale, was preaching on this and says the love of many would grow cold. I'm just sharing my observations, and it, it really grieves me because I do not see a lot of love in the discourse and the dialogue that's going on. And again, I'm not here to be a politician. I'm not here to, to, uh, to, to put forward a hope, uh, unfair judgment. But I see, I, I, I say to myself, where is the love? Where is the love? When we, are, when we are making a stand for righteousness, are we standing in love? When people hear us talk, are they hearing judgment and, and condemnation and damnation? And I'm not using that word flippantly, but damning someone is committing them to hell are we doing that? Are we operating in love? That's part of this, the main thing. Are we, as a church, responding in love? I looked up uh, unity. It means oneness. But you, unity is also an identity piece. And that's another thing I've been really working my way through. I've got lots of time now about this whole thing of identity. Who are we? Who are we in Christ? What have we been called to do? do where do I belong? And, and so unity, we are to be united with Jesus. It says that in being when we are baptized, we are united with him in his death, and we will be united with him in his resurrection. There's a continuity of unity is continuity without change. It's about staying on the path and not getting segged off. It has to do with purpose and action. It has to do with agreement. Now, one of the synonyms is symphony. I, I had the privilege of, of being in a, in a wonderful band uh, where I grew up, and we had marching band, and it was all about play as loud as you could and, and play as exciting a music as you could, but then we would shift af after a, a U.S. Thanksgiving, and we go into symphonic band, and I can't tell you, there's, re there's really things in this earth, that, this earth that are more meaningful. I, it was a, a band of 120, and we all practiced, and and, you know, and when the band director would get up at the concert and he would drop that baton and the band would, or the, the symphonic band would come together and just the whole place would just be filled with music. And uh, that's part of this. We need to be playing together and recognize the fact that each one of you, like each instrument, has a particular role that adds to this beauty. Are we a symphony of praise? Are we a symphony? It's a question. Now, many people have some funny ideas about unity. They think that unity means everyone must do the same thing. Now, come on now, we've all got to do the same thing. I would suggest to you that is not love, that's control. You only fit in if you do what everybody else is doing. Are we so arrogant to think that our way is the way? Some people think that unity means conformity. And there's this fear of allowing someone to be different. I suggest the cookie-cutter mentality that sacrifices the unique, uniqueness of each individual created in the image of God is not the heart of God. We need this unity in diversity. Another thing that people think that, is, that I think is, is funny is that unity naturally happens and keeps on happening. 
we're going to see where Paul writes and he says, preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, that it is something that we must constantly be aware of. It doesn't just naturally happen and it doesn't just keep on happening unless we really walk in a manner that is worthy of our calling. And it, do, it, it doesn't happen naturally. That means that we, in many places, and you remember this from September 5th, I remember that sermon well, where we lay down our, our human rights in the service of others. That's what Jesus did. Though he existed in the form of God, he did not think of equality with God, but he laid down his life. It wasn't taken from him. I want to talk more about, well, what about all this stuff? Aren't we supposed to take a stand? We'll get to that. So a more complete and correct understanding of unity releases, not restricts. There is unity and diversity. We, we talked about a band or a symphony, and we talked about the example of the human bi- body. Paul talks about that in, in Roman, I mean, sorry, in 1 Corinthians about, you know, we need eyes, we need ears, we need mouths, we need hands, we need legs, we need lungs, we need all of those things. We need the diversity, but there needs to be a united body. Now, here's a list of some unity killers. I sat in my office putting this together. and says, what are things that kill unity? Well, first of all, judgment kills unity. And even the statement, don't judge me, is a judgment. And I, I just did my, my devotional. I do this on Facebook. And I said, did Jesus really say don't judge? No, he says judge not lest you be judged for how you judge is how you'll be judged. It's sowing and reaping. Are we judging in a, in, a, in, a, in a condemning way or are we trying to judge and say, is that in line with what God would want us to do? Is that in line with what the scriptures say? What's the Holy Spirit saying? So judgment needs to be seasoned with the salt of, uh, and light and the oil of God. Be careful. Jealousy. Well, uh, you know, I'm jealous, and jealousy, people start to do goofy things. Misunderstanding. How often do we just go off on a, on a tangent and on a rant, and we've misunderstood? And so Stephen Covey, in his book, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he says, seek first to understand and be understood. I wish I had learned that earlier, that so often something would trigger me, and I would go off, and, and then the person's looking at me kind of just, oh, my goodness, I'm under assault. He said, well, that's not what I'm saying. That understanding or misunderstanding is a unity killer. It requires you to put aside your agendas and listen. False assumptions. My dad says where that false assumptions arise and misunderstanding is unavoidable and hurt feelings arise. Assumptions, things that run in the background where, and that, that, that has to do with judgment. Well, I know what that person's thinking or we start to assign motives. Gossip. Did you know? Blah, 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 blah. And it's interesting to me that the church that I, during the time I grew up, it was very interesting about how it would point out things that were visible but would, would allow other things to go by the board that were equally destructive, like gossip, backbiting, selfish ambition, pride. I got the angle. I know what's best. And we don't always, we're not always aware of that. And I want to quote C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity. I quote this often. He said, he had an article about, in this book about pride. He says, and if you think you do not have pride, then you are very proud indeed. It always, I always trip when somebody says, oh, Lord, keep me humble. That presupposes that you are humble. I pray, Lord, help me be humble for I'm a very proud man. We need to be aware that we need the transforming power of Jesus. And selfish ambition. So what are some things, that's the, what are unity killers, but what are some things that promote unity? One is when we adopt one purpose. What is our purpose? We said, Jesus said, go in all the world, preach the gospel, baptize in them in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he said, I want you to go and be my authentic witnesses, light. Prayer. We see that prayer was an, an essential part of the early church that we see in Acts. Corporate gatherings, it says they gathered together. I need to have people in my life, especially now that I live uh, by myself. I need people. I need to, to interact with people. I need to talk with people. I need people that will encourage me, and I need to encourage others. It's this part about God is calling us to community. We need to praise because praise is, a, is something that promotes unity. And we praise in the midst of adversity. We see that in Acts 4, 24. 
And then we see in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14, I'm going to read it. It says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion. Now, I want you to pay attention to this. Are we, am I, are we, are we embracing these spiritual kingdom values and responses? Clothe yourself with compassion, with kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Bear with each other. Forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you in all these things. Virtue, put on virtue and sorry. And over all these things, virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Here's my concern. And we're going to get to the application uh, when we get to the end of this. But I'm concerned. Are you and I, are we nursing grievances? Are we harboring those things? Well, people said this, or people judged me here, or, you know, I felt ostracized, or whatever. And, and it says here, it says, and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. I find that uh, another one of my friends says that what you resist persists, and what did you do to create that? And so I believe that there is this time God is calling us to lay down our grievances, Unity then promotes an environment that is conducive to the working of the Spirit, the manifest presence of God, and a place where the kingdom of God can work. It says, for there does God command his blessing. Uh, Psalm 133. Then we get to Philippians. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy, but being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and one mind. Agreement, speaking the same thing. No division, no schism, no discord and disharmony. And it also covers the act of promoting schisms. And I'm seeing that coming back to this disunity. It wounds me when I see people of the kingdom of God operating in the kingdom of darkness, where they're stirring up divisions and they're looking for things to fight about. We are called to look to place to bring places of peace and say, how do you understand it? And what does the Bible have to say about it? Let's work towards walking in this way. That is what God has called us to. Jesus made a warning. He said, any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. And a house divided against itself will fall. That's a wonderful admonition. And it is a stern warning. And again, my concern is God is calling us to unity because a house, a church, a family, a marriage, a friendship, a, a friendship group, any of those things where they are divided, that will cause that house to fall. That's not my opinion. That's what the Word of God says. I also, as I was working through this, that the, a result... Um, of, of spiritual maturity is unity. Unity is something that grows out of spiritual maturity. So my dad, he used the, the great one, one-liners, and he used to say, you know, he used to said I was just so quick to pick up at a, at a fence or a graduate fight, and he said, I learned to just say, well, you know what? You may be right. You may be right. And what that does, that's an invitation for relationship and dialogue instead of saying, you're just stupid and you're wrong. <laughs> We see here in Ephesians that we're not to give the devil any opportunity. And, and a lack of unity opens the door to disorder and every evil thing. But he says, put away bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor. That's not a word we use much, but it means cry out loud, uproar, noisy, demand, or complain, slander, spreading falsehood. And he says, be kind to one another. This is Ephesians 4.32, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God has forgiven you. Do you see much of what I'm saying about unity? It circles, continues to circle around love, and love is kind and forgives and releases people to God. So now we come to application. And one of the things that I have learned in this last while is, so what, now what? So here's some questions that are, that are questions for reflection. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? Amos 3, 4. How is that possible? Does agreement and walking together mean on everything or on the fundamentals? I have lots of friends who ha ha hold differing views on a host of things. 
And it doesn't matter to me uh, if they have a different team that they want to win the Super Bowl or the Stanley Cup. It doesn't matter to me whether they like a Toyota over a Honda. It doesn't matter. There's a lot of things, and it's okay. You know, we're, we're unique and whatever. So, you, you, so we need to realize that unity doesn't mean that we have to be in agreement on everything, but we do need to be in agreement on fundamentals. And you say, well, how do we know what the fundamentals are? Well, let me tell you, that's why, that's why we have this, and that's why we have the Holy Spirit. And I challenge you, and I challenge myself to continue to say, what's the main thing? Am I walking in love? Am I laying down my life in service of others? Am I being an authentic witness of Jesus? Uh, St. Augustine said, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Second question. What kingdom will we operate in? Will we succumb to the spirit of Antichrist now at work in the world. Now, I'm not talking about Antichrist with the, with the big guy, you know, the guy that's going to, or the entity that's going to take over the whole world, but this, the Bible talks about the spirit of Antichrist. Are we going to, are we going to function in the kingdom of God, or are we going to succumb to the spirit of Antichrist, and are we going to begin to respond in the kingdom of darkness? Now, there's a passage of scripture here, Luke 16, 8, that's very curious. And uh, this is what it says. Is the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. And it says, For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. Jesus told this, this story of how there was this shrewd manager and he was working all the angles. And it says, The master commended. says, You understand your system. You understand how to play the kingdom of darkness better than those who are the sons of God. And are we walking in the kingdom of, of God? And that, that's another big question. That would be a, another whole series. Is, what is the kingdom of God? Are you am i working in the right kingdom then there's the yes but we must do something and i find that that has been both a truth and a trap when when evil is prospering we are called to to make a stand but the question is are we standing in righteousness in the kingdom of god or are we standing in the kingdom of this world are we fighting the physical with with spiritual, or are we fighting in our own abilities? We must fight spirit with spirit. Will we propagate hatred and disunity, or will we follow the example of Jesus and love as he loved? What will we unite around? What is the source of our unity? Luke twelve thirty one. Seek first and foremost the kingdom of God. Who is the source of our unity? The source of our unity is and must always be Jesus. What would Jesus do? Not what Tom do or what would so-and-so do, but what cause can I pick up today? But I really want to challenge us to walk in the kingdom. It's for It says in 1 Corinthians 12, 25, for we purpose not to allow any division in the body or all of our relations for that matter. Will we pray as much as we complain and pontificate? I want to just close with this. I got to thinking, and, and on my, my sheet here, it says, we need to examine our life. And, and I thought about it like, you know, do we need to repent? I think that if we're walking in the Spirit, we have to repent on a regular basis. And I really like the way it says, it says, change the way we think and act. Do I need to examine, am I walking in, what kingdom am I walking in? Am I walking in dissension and disunity? Am I actually contributing to that? Or am I going to be a person that is going to walk in the kingdom of God in love? So I want to encourage you to just take a moment and you, when you turn this off, to just go through all of these things. Where are you? Where am I? And I want to leave with a positive exhortation. We don't have to live like this. We don't have to live in the brokenness. We don't have to live in the dissension. We don't have to live in the disunity. We don't have to be standing on soapboxes. I just really want to encourage you as I was praying about this. I felt the Lord wanted me to leave with this and says, let's go. Let's change the world. And recognizing the fact that the world changes as we change. That's my charge. Let's pray. Oh, Father, 
I would pray, God, that you would challenge all of us. As I was working my way through this, I saw places where I need to change the way I think and act. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that Sunshine Hills and that all of the places in our marriages, in our families, in our extended families, in our friendship groups, where we work, Lord, let us be people who are walking in the kingdom of this kingdom of Jesus and not the kingdom of darkness that, that is so prevalent. Lord, I thank you that you're with us. We want to be people who have the same mind as you have, to see people who are far from God come to wholeness and strength, that we are fighting for the freedom in the spirit. We ask this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. What a wonderful word from Pastor Tom for today. And I hope you're excited for next Sunday as we will have Erica Jones joining us to share the word that God has laid on her heart um, while our men's retreat is going on. So prepare yourself for that. I know that she has just a fantastic encouragement for our church for that day. Now, I just want to let you know about our missions focus for the month of April which is Mercy Canada. Mercy is an organization that uh, is Christian-based and works with women of all ages to help them overcome life-controlling issues, uh, traumatic issues arising from their past, be it uh, eating disorders or um, self-harm issues, suicidal ideation, mental health issues. They have a wellness center uh, where women can come and receive counseling, receive uh, course training on how to overcome some of these issues. And they have lots that they're doing uh, to make sure that our community of women is supported uh, and that they can get the help that they need at no cost to them. And a big part of that is that they need donations to be able to provide this so that uh, cost is not a barrier for these women to get the help that they need. So we wanted to focus on them this month. Uh, in May, on May 7th, it is their Walk for Wellness, which if you'd like more information on how you can get involved with that, you can just visit this website here on the screen. It'll also be in the link below this video. Uh, and the Walk for Wellness is a great way to raise funds for Mercy, to um, learn more about them, to raise awareness for what they do. But you can also donate generally to them throughout the year if that's something that you'd like to support. Uh, if you're giving at the church, whether it's in person or by e-transfer, if you mark it missions uh, or mercy, we'll make sure that your donation goes towards supporting the work that they do. So why don't you join me? We're just going to pray over their ministry and everything that God is doing through Mercy Canada. Lord God, we thank you that we can partner with such integral and excellent organizations that are working uh, to be your hands and feet, to bring peace, to bring comfort, to bring wisdom and guidance to those in desperate need. God, we ask that for the women that use the services at Mercy, that they would find uh, your love through that, that the counseling, that the courses, that the, the material that Mercy gives them and puts in their hands would bring them into newness of life and into closer relationship with you. We thank you for the work that they're doing. We pray that they would be blessed financially and with uh, abundant resources to fulfill their mission and calling. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you so much for joining with us today. I look forward to seeing you or seeing you back online next week. Until then, have a great week.